This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. War ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. ended with a new weapon for a new age. This is the history of the greatest of all man-made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. those who could pay and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. Both of the main Axis partners had enjoyed extraordinary success with their initial offensives. Germany and Central Europe, in Western Europe, and in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Japan in the Pacific and in Burma, Malaya, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies. In 1943, the complexion of the war changed. By the turn of the year, the Axis was on the defensive everywhere. Through 1944, in every theater of war, Allied strength would grow in the East, in the Soviet Union, and with the opening of the Second Front. The Allied bombing campaign against Germany was relentless. The dwindling stocks of the Luftwaffe, which could have made a valuable contribution on the Eastern Front, were committed to the defense of German cities and German industry, as were many tens of thousands of military personnel. For six months, from September 1943 to the last day of March 1944, RAF and American bombers hammered German targets. From January, they were supported by long-range fighter escorts as the Mustang P-51Bs came into service. We flew at 30,000 feet with no heat in the plane, so it was really cold. We had a flight suit which looked like an electric blanket with a plug at the navel, which had a cord which we could plug into the airplane, and it would heat our suit, which made it really comfortable. We were OK. Bomber Command continued its concentration on the cities. Encouraged by the devastating raids that had unleashed a firestorm on Hamburg, killing more than 40,000, Arthur Harris turned to the capital in what became known as the Battle of Berlin. Though the Führer moved around Berlin with the curtains drawn in his car so that he would not have to see the damage being done to his capital, extensive raids failed to cripple the city. By the time I got there, we had something called G. I had a screen as navigator in my part of the plane. 
where I could know exactly where I was. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From uncovering ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historian. Not only that, but we have a huge podcast network releasing new episodes every day, so you'll always have something to listen to. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. If there was cloud cover, which there usually was, I would use that. Otherwise, I'd just have to do dead reckoning and try to recognize the, the drift. Attacking military objectives was more effective. Big week in February, in which the RAF and the US 8th and 15th Air Forces dropped more than 15,000 tons of explosives on aircraft and aircraft component factories, permanently injured the Luftwaffe. It's the spirit through the whole thing was one of purpose. The camaraderie was, uh, was excellent. The acceptance of losing a buddy was excellent. It was never, never a question of we shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be doing this, never, by anyone. It had become clear by the spring of 1944 that bombing would not bring a population to its knees and end the war. At the end of March, Bomber Command had launched a raid on Nuremberg in which 94 bombers had been shot down and 540 aircrew killed. A greater death toll than Fighter Command had suffered during the whole of the Battle of Britain. Nuremberg suffered minimal damage. This was the raid that ended Arthur Harris's Battle of Berlin. 1,000 aircraft had been lost. The bombers were transferred to another task. Their role in the invasion of Europe. Across the globe, it was Allied forces that were facing invasion. The Imperial Japanese Army renewed offensive operations in Burma. The Chinese were almost entirely dependent for modern military equipment on their allies. In 1943, delivery of these supplies had been drastically curtailed by the loss of Burma and the Burma Road. Efforts to construct an alternative route, the Lido Road, faltered with the onset of the rains. Allied plans for the resumption of operations in 1944 were focused on securing northern Burma so that the Lido Road could be completed. The American General Joe Stilwell, commanding the Chinese army in Burma, would move down from Lido to the Burmese border, then swing north, building the road as he went. Meanwhile, British General Ord Wingate's long-range group, the Chindits, would be airlifted to the Irrawaddy, cutting Japanese communications south of Stilwell's force. The Chinese expeditionary force operating out of China under General Wei Li Huang would move against the Japanese at Tengue, pushing the 56th Division towards Wingate. That plan was initiated on February the 5th when the first elements of the Chindits began their march from Lido. The following day, Japanese attacked. The 55th Division moving north with the intention of looping around and attacking the 15th Indian Corps from the rear. As the Japanese offensive continued, Attempts to gain an advantage in the Burmese state of Arakan were called off. First time that British and Indian troops had successfully repelled a Japanese assault. 
I was a forward scout. About 100 yards up on the rest of the section. But you couldn't see anything. And all you could see was a mass of greenery. All of a sudden, the shot rang out. Now I couldn't go forward then because I didn't know how many Japs I had. It was just the one shot. And they shot our corporal. I was expecting to get shot, carrying him back. They brought in the Americans, bombing the top of the hill where the Japs was. They pulled out during the night. So that was that. In early March, the Chindits were flown into the Kalkwe Valley, and for once an airborne assault went well. An early Japanese attempt to dislodge the force was easily beaten off. South of the Chindit landing zone, the major part of the planned Japanese offensive got underway, a week earlier than General Slim facing the attack had anticipated. With the Japanese was a division of the Indian National Army, raised by the Indian independence leader Subhas Chandra Bose from Indian prisoners of the Japanese. These men, on crossing the Chindwin, fell to their knees shouting, Jai Hind, Hail India. The Japanese 33rd Division made progress before turning north towards the Indian 20th and beginning to threaten Impal. The 20th was ordered to take a position on the Impal Road and hold it. For three months of fierce fighting, they held it. Japanese objective became clear. Kahima was a major base, more importantly, it was a railhead and the gateway to Dimapur, an enormous supply depot for the British in India. The Japanese 15th Division cut the Impal Kohima Road. As they closed on Kohima, the British command suffered a setback. Lord Wingate was in the tradition of eccentric British soldier mystics. Gordon of Khartoum, Lawrence of Arabia, was killed in a plane crash. Command of the Chindits passed to Vinegar Joe Stilwell. On April the 3rd, the Japanese 31st Division closed on Kahima. On that same day, one British infantry battalion arrived to garrison the depot. Besieged, they fought a desperate battle for two weeks. The perimeter contracted, more and more of the village fell in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. At times, less than 15 meters separated the front lines. We existed on parachute supplies, you know. They dropped the Russians by parachute which the Japs never had nothing like that. Japan's failure to supply and support her troops meant that 60% of Japan's 1.74 million military losses during the war were victims of starvation or disease. On April the 18th, a Punjabi battalion and a tank detachment succeeded in breaking through to Kahima. The defenders had suffered 300 casualties, but had held out. The order was push the Japanese back. They're not going to get any more supplies. They're not going to get any medicine. So they tried to push east. 
The Japanese could not get the villages to give that much food. So that they sometimes forced the villages. So the word went round, get out of the village if they come. The Burmese will go after them now. That you chaps, you bullied us now. They start killing some of them. So they were in a terrible state. On May the 11th, General Wei Li Huang began his offensive. In mid-June, the Kohima Impal Road was reopened. The Japanese, they were never taken prisoner. They generally killed themselves. まあ、頭の中に今だにまだ覚えてますよ。the India-Burma battlefield was not the only scene of offensive action in the Asia-Pacific theatre during 1944. The Marshalls and the Gilbert Islands captured and secure, Allied planning turned towards the Marianas and beyond that, the Philippines. The Japanese could read a map as well as the Americans, and they too identified the strategic significance of the Marianas. They planned to respond to the expected American assault by deploying a strong fleet in combination with aircraft based on the Marianas. Together, the plan proposed they would destroy the American carrier force. That carrier force was the largest naval force yet to assemble in the Pacific. Built around 15 carriers, it was supported by the 5th Fleet with seven battleships and 21 cruisers. And then there was the invasion fleet which was carrying four full divisions of troops and included a further 12 escort carriers, five battleships and 11 cruisers. Admiral Toyoda had command of the fleet assembling to face the Americans and to counter their massive armada, he had five battleships and eight carriers. June the 11th, the assault on the Marianas began with a bombing attack on the most northerly of the islands. Taking it first would prevent reinforcements coming from Japan. The most northerly of the islands was Saipan. It had a garrison of 32,000. The Saipan landings were strongly opposed and casualties were high, in part because the fleet and air cover had to be withdrawn when the Japanese naval force was spotted and the navies positioned themselves for the Battle of the Philippine Sea. On the 19th and 20th of June, 1944, the largest carrier battle in history was fought. Japanese initiated action with the launch of airstrikes against the US carriers, but the incoming waves were plotted on radar. As a result, the Japanese lost 219 aircraft, the Americans 29. On that first day, Two Japanese carriers were sunk by submarines. On the second day, the main US carrier force, Admiral Mark Mitcher, attacked the Japanese, sinking one carrier 
and destroying 65 aircraft. The Americans dubbed the action the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. In the final tally, the Japanese had lost three carriers and 480 aircraft. The Americans had lost no ships and 29 aircraft. The losses to material and more significantly to trained aircrew permanently and fatally weakened Japan. A novel solution to her shortage of skilled pilots would be found and named for the divine wind that had twice in the 13th century destroyed Mongol invasion fleets, saving Japan. That wind was called kamikaze. On the 6th of July, the commanders on Saipan ordered a final suicide attack and then committed suicide. The next day, their orders were followed. When the battle was over, 26,000 Japanese were dead. American dead totaled 3,426. We were off Saipan, we saw civilians diving off the cliffs, committing suicide with their children. Ten days after the fall of Saipan under increasing criticism for the conduct of the war, General Hideki Tojo resigned as Prime Minister. Three days later, the 1st U.S. Marine Division landed on Guam. On the 24th, the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions landed on Tinian. Resistance there ended on August the 1st and on Guam on the 10th. Although the last Japanese soldier was not to surrender until 1960. We hit Guam and I got a nice dose of malaria. 105 fever. They treated me a little bit aboard ship, but they sent me home. Believe it or not, I was sent home. Only those that was in the service knows that feeling, hear your name, pack up, you're going home. Japan was losing the war. In the European theater, Allied progress in Italy was slow and costly. Having landed on the mainland in September 1943, forces had moved north towards Rome and the first of the German defensive positions, the Gustav Line. American divisions moved along the Mediterranean coast from Salerno and through Naples, and the British Eighth Army moved to link up with commandos who had landed at Termoli on the Adriatic coast. From early November, the Allies faced a formidable opponent, Albert Kesselring. At the end of November, Montgomery launched the 8th Army at the Gustav Line and breached the defences in the east. But at the beginning of 1944, both Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander, and Montgomery were withdrawn from Italy to concentrate on planning the invasion of Europe. Also in January of 1944, and despite losses of four and a half million, the German armed forces reached their greatest strength. Nine and a half million under arms. 
Although the numbers may misrepresent the quality of those now conscripted to fight, the Wehrmacht that faced Mark Clark's US 5th Army on the western end of the Gustav Line remained a formidable enemy. January 22nd, to outflank the defensive position, Operation Shingle landed the US 3rd and British 1st Divisions behind the line at a place called Anzio. It was to become, briefly, the world's fourth busiest port. A strong beachhead was established 24 kilometers wide and 12 deep, but by then, Kesselring had ordered reinforcements into the area and six divisions had moved up. In mid-February, the Americans began their assault on Gustav, attempting the breakthrough that would allow them to link up with forces advancing from the Anzio beachhead. Within a week, the American commander at Anzio had been replaced, a punishment for his lack of progress. Germans continued their pressure on Anzio in Operation Fishfang, catch fish, and it was only Allied air supremacy that kept them at bay. Assault on the Gustav Line had meanwhile been held up at a place called Monte Cassino. From February the 2nd to May the 17th, the Allies launched five offensives against Cassino's Benedictine Monastery. 135 US flying fortresses reduced it to rubble. In the rubble, and in command of the high ground, the Germans repelled attempts by Indian, Canadian, British and New Zealand formations. Finally, General Alphonse Jouin's Free French, led by Moroccan irregulars skilled in mountain warfare, opened the way for the Polish Second Corps to carry Monte Cassino. On May the 17th, the Polish flag flew above the ruins as the Germans finally withdrew. With my friend, I explored the area at night and we found German helmets. And with German helmets, we pretended to be Germans. They are question and we would say, Jawohl, Jawohl. And there were 12 cement bunkers with one window each from which they were shooting. And we managed to disabled them by throwing grenades into the bunkers. And that, that's why we managed to destroy them. The casino front had taken the Allies three months for an advance of 15 kilometers. By late May, German divisions were being badly mauled and Rome lay ahead. The plan called for a drive east to Valmonte to cut off the withdrawing German 10th Army. Admiral Mark Clark had other ideas, rather imperial ideas. His determination to be the liberator of the Eternal City allowed the 10th German Army to withdraw intact. June the 5th, Mark Clark led his forces into Rome. He failed to receive the publicity he hoped for. The following day was D-Day. It had taken the Allies nine months to advance from toe to knee at the cost of 40,000 Allied and 25,000 German casualties. The spring thaw that transformed the Eastern Front meant that the Russians could begin their offensive and on the 4th of March, they had moved. But they advanced without one of their best commanders. Nikolai Vatutin, ambushed by partisans fighting for an independent Ukraine, had died of his wounds. The strategic aim of the Spring Offensive was to drive a wedge between Army Group A and Army Group South. 
At the moment, the best news comes from the Russian front, where the Red Army has been scoring one triumph after another, beating back the invaders, smashing their defences. In the first two days, Zhukov's first Ukrainian front advanced 40 kilometers despite the clinging mud. By the end of the month, Hitler had sacked the commanders of both army groups, von Kleist and von Manstein. Walter Model and Ferdinand Schirner, lesser commanders but better Nazis, were appointed to replace them. On April the 8th, Soviet forces advanced into the Crimea. In only two days, Odessa fell. On the 17th, Turnipil fell to Zhukov. Not a well-known battle, not a major city, but Hitler had declared Turnipil to be a fortress. A Führerfestung. And the 4,500-man garrison defended it accordingly. 55 Germans survived the assault. By mid-May, with the surrender of the final 25,000 troops, the Crimea had been cleared and Soviet attention turned to the summer. To planning the greatest offensive of the war, Operation Bagration. Migration was designed to coincide with the invasion of Western Europe. The second front that Stalin had been promised would at last be opened in 1944. Planning for the Second Front had been underway since April 1943. Hundreds and hundreds of men and women, without the help of a single computer or calculator or mobile telephone, planned the logistics that would deliver support, supply and reinforce an immense invasion force shipped across 35 kilometers of unpredictable sea and landed on defended beaches. Their work involved masses of men and material and depended on secrecy. All sorts of deceptions were employed. The British 4th Army in Scotland drew German units north. But there was no 4th Army. Patton's 1st Army, based in the southeast, was a clear threat to the Channel ports. But there was no 1st American Army under Patton. For every bomb dropped on Normandy, three were dropped elsewhere. The Germans were heavily dependent on intelligence received from their agents in the United Kingdom. But by D-Day, every one of their agents had been turned and was supplying Germany with false information. The greater part of the south coast region of England to a depth of 16 kilometers was declared a military zone. Villages were evacuated and the invasion was practiced. Eisenhower, in supreme command, had an Anglo-American team of meteorologists to advise him, and they warned against the 5th of June, the original date, but gave the go-ahead for the 6th. So Eisenhower gave the order for the invasion. It was headed, the tide has turned. I hope to God, Eisenhower said, I know what I'm doing. We were just waiting, loading and unloading, when we started to load tanks is when we said, mm-mm, uh, this is it. There wasn't anything mentioned as far as uh, uh, going for an invasion, but there was a lot of ships. We didn't know much about it prior to the sort of few days before D-Day, except that we knew we were going to invade France. We had photographs of our uh, targets in, on the beach in Juneau and all the rest of it. 
So the only thing we got to eat on the way over was this new stuff, a shellfish and soup. Most men eat it, so the bottom got red hot and all the vegetables got burnt and the top was cold. There's all sorts of things like that went wrong. I was amazed at the efficiency of it all. We were told which number landing craft we would be on, so we were going down hundreds and hundreds of vehicles. They said, you know, you're on landing craft 59. I said, no hope of that. In fact, as, as we got there, in comes landing craft 59. It was quite extraordinarily efficient. The whole fleet, they were around the other way. They called the name Piccadilly Circuit. And when I see all those boards, they're ready to go. I, I then we say, we could not lose. Facing the invasion in overall command was von Rundstedt. In command of the forces opposing the landing, Army Group B, was Erwin Rommel. Though on D-Day itself, Rommel was absent on leave. It was his wife's birthday. There were 850,000 men in von Rundstedt's command, amongst whom, choosing to fight as soldiers and not die as prisoners, were 60,000 Russians. The Germans had less tanks for the defense of France in 1944 than they had marshaled for its conquest in 1940. But they had the fortified Atlantic Wall, which had been Hitler's idea and which extended over 2,000 kilometers and boasted 12,000 bunkers. Two million slave laborers had worked for two years to build the wall. Much of its weaponry had been stripped and shipped from the Maginot Line. The invasion armada comprised 700 warships. Their role was both air defense and shore bombardment. 2,700 ships supported the land. They carried the supplies, the reinforcements, and the infrastructure in the form of fuel pipelines and floating mulberry harbors that would make the landing sustainable. And there were two and a half thousand landing craft. Each of the ship's captains received a book with 700 pages of instructions. Above them, the Allied air forces flew thousands of aircraft. The Germans could meet them with only 170 serviceable machines. A total of three million Allied personnel were involved in the effort. Five thousand ships, all gathering together to make the invasion into Normandy. It was a sight to see, you know, on a horizon seeing all these ships. They look like little dots getting bigger and bigger and then merging into Normandy Beach. Anybody who was there will say the ships, the aircraft, one would never ever forget it. Going across in the convoy, there were so many landing craft. Sailors were all talking to each other by semaphore, just using their arms. They were all so close together, they could talk to other craft. It was very rough. Uh, there was no cover in the landing craft, you're just lying on the deck. I was extremely sick and spent most of the time praying that the Germans would come and sink us. I spent the night in my boat. It was obviously going to be a busy day ahead. The invaders landed on a 90-kilometer-plus stretch of five beaches along the Normandy coast. The names given to those beaches by the planners are an indestructible part of the history of the war. The 21st Army Group, General Montgomery, sailed from ports along the British coast. The US 1st Army, General Bradley, landing on Utah and Omaha beaches. 
the British Second Army, General Dempsey, landing on gold, Juno, and sword. The US 82nd and 101st Airborne landed behind Utah, the British 6th Airborne behind Sword. It was calculated that of the airborne troops dropped on the night of June 5th, 6th, up to 75% landing at the wrong locations took no part in the early fighting. Rommel had 34 divisions opposing the landing, but many were facing the wrong way. Most were under strength, and some were feeble units comprising exclusively men with stomach complaints. Five Allied divisions came ashore. The first, the US 4th Infantry Division landed 1,800 metres from its target due to a strong current, but that swept it to a weakly defended position. The 4th landed 23,000 men on D-Day and took only 197 casualties. It was a different story on Omaha. We couldn't hit Omaha Beach in its entirety. So we had to lower the ramp uh, as much as we can, and everybody had to go into the water. A lot of the people with gear went down, and some of them perished because of the gear. Omaha Beach was dominated by cliffs from which, for much of the day, the US 1st and 29th Divisions were pinned by intense fire. The swimming tanks had been launched prematurely and many foundered, leaving the infantry without cover. By day's end, 55,000 had been landed, but at a cost of more than 4,600 casualties. The third beach left to right was Gold, where the British 50th Division landed, supported by 8th Armoured Brigade. I got to the water, got chest deep, and I got out of the water onto the sand. And uh, I'd only gone about three or four paces. My number two went down alongside me, and the blood was spurting out. I went down to him and I said, come on, Charlie, come on. Somebody screamed at me, get off the beach, get off the beach. She didn't have to tell me. I was on my, on my way anyway. But you can't just leave the mate. Third Canadian Division landed on Juneau, where it met particular difficulty with underwater obstacles and rough water. By nightfall, had made contact with the British 50th on its right. The final beach was Sword, where the British 3rd Division landed successfully. Amongst all that, there were Navy chaps standing there directing everybody off the beach. Get off! Get off! Off the beach! Off your beach! There was one of them, and he was looking at his shoulder in a stupid sort of way, you know. There was bits of his arm flying off as the bullets were hitting them. He was taking a full burst in his shoulder, and he was just looking at it. God knows how many men they lost in that way. The perhaps inevitable general confusion, the mass of men and machines, and the contrasting levels of success created an opportunity for the defenders, initially wrong-footed and slow to respond, to redeploy. The 21st Panzer Division took a firm grip on Cain, denying it to the Allies for whom it had been a D-Day objective. 
they continued to defend the town for some time. The first job was to take the blockers opposite the, the, the bridge. And then we crossed the minefield. That minefield, you know, was seven tanks were on the right to land with us. We'd been given three tanks just for the landing to cut the wire. They lasted five minutes, I believe. And one after the other. Bang, bang, bang. We're hit. The Germans had the 88s, and the 88s were a tremendous weapon. As June 6th wore on, units began to extend the perimeter away from the beaches, short of the proposed target line, but beginning to move into the villages on or behind the coast. Get off the beach as fast as you can, and turn right at the little road that you come across. And eventually you'll see the church and make your own way there through the streets. So I went up to the door, I took the, the Colt 45 out, and I aimed at the lock, John Wayne fashion. Bang. As soon as I fired that shot, there's a tap on my shoulder. And I turned around, and there's this man, dressed in black, parish priest, and shaking his head. And he walked over to it and just turned it and opened it. I walked in there as humble as anything, but the, well, completely and utterly humiliated. <laughs> a big roughy, chuffy commando. God, let me see. It was late afternoon before Hitler gave permission for the deployment of two panzer divisions that had been held in reserve. At the end of June the 6th, he was still not fully convinced that the Normandy landing was the real invasion rather than a feint. But it was no feint. This is Schwein. To think that this Schwein, in the night of the two, we were revealed, alarm. The Americans were not going to be in Normandy. We had to prepare our affairs. And in the night of the six or seven, we were going the Landerno, Jusca, Saint Lo. It's about 350 kilometers. And the 350 kilometers, we have been able to get up here. And especially in the night. Because in the night, it's dangerous with the American aircraft or the English American aircraft. By the end of the first day, the Allies were short of their target line along almost the whole length of the invasion. But they had 156,000 men ashore, established ashore, supported ashore, they had control of the sky, naval support was unchallenged, meaning that reinforcement and resupply would be unhindered. It had not been a walk in the park. In only three weeks, the Allies would land 800,000 troops. They would break out from Normandy and begin to roll back the German conquests. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, the Allies move out of the Normandy beachhead and begin the advance that will carry them across the Rhine. The Soviet Union launches Operation Bagration and begins the offensive that will carry it to Berlin. And in Asia, the Philippines falls and Allied troops step onto Japanese territory.